Uh, our next speaker is John Garrick. Uh, John is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and Vice Chair of the National Research Council's Committee for Improving Safety and Security of U.S. Nuclear Plants. Uh, he served for 10 years on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Advisory Committee on Nuclear Waste, and he chaired the National Academy of Engineers' uh, Committee on Combating Terrorism. And from 2004 to 2012, he was chair of the U.S. Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board, a presidentially appointed board. Welcome, John. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Drs. Uh, Krager and uh, Crowley have very interestingly chronicled the events and debates shaping our understanding of the acute and latent biological effects of radiation. The, the separation of somatic and genetic linkage have occupied much of the debate uh, on this topic, especially during the 1940s and the 1950s. And the institutional problems and issues that uh, Dr. Krager in indicated were most fascinating part of the story. My interest in radiation hazards is from the point of view of quantifying the risks, uh, both safety and environmental, of activities involving very large inventories of radioactive material. The nuclear power plants are the primary example. The focus of the nuclear plant risk studies is on high consequence events such as severe accidents that might occur from within the facility or as a result of a severe outside event, such as a severe weather event, or something of the magnitude of the great eastern Japan earthquake that occurred on March 11, 2011. The credibility of quantitative risk assessment depends primarily on two factors. The ability to model events that lead to radiation exposure threats that's a big one, and the ability to represent the health and safety effects resulting from the exposure of the subject of this panel. Uh, consider the effects on the screen. Uh, these are bottom line results of one of many industry-sponsored full-scope risk assessments that I had the honor to lead, and this one was over 30 years ago. This study followed the publishing of the reactor safety study for the US nuclear, by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission had any policies, regulations, or rules on risk assessment. Uh, such plant-specific full-scope assessments have not been performed since the 1980s. To be sure, there have been risk assessments, but they've been limited in scope. The figures illustrate six measures of risk, early fatalities, injuries, thyroid cancers, <clears throat> latent cancer fatalities, whole body dose, and property damage and evacuation costs. And this w particular analysis was based on the health effects model of the 1972 Beer Report. The risk curves are presented in the form of frequency as a function of consequences or consequence with probability as the parameter of the model represented by a family of curves. The question relevant to the topic of this panel is where are we now with respect to modeling health effects and how should our current state of knowledge impact our attempts at quantifying the risk of complex nuclear systems? For some of the answers, I turn to the Beer 7 report. The advances certainly continue the trend noted by Dr. Greg Krager in her remarks and have to do with, among other topics, a better understanding of the relationship between spontaneous mutations and naturally occurring genetic diseases. One of the important conclusions, as we've already heard in the Beer 7 report and similar to previous reports, was, uh, quote, uh, the linear no threshold model, LNT, provided the most reasonable description of the relation between low-dose exposure to ionizing radiation and the incidence of solid cancers that are introduced by ionizing radiation, end of quote. So what does this mean to the risk analyst, like me, attempting to perform quantitative risk assessments of models of, of complex systems, where by quantitative, what I really mean is quantif quantification of the uncertainties in the risk measures? <clears throat> 
Well, consistent with consistency in terms of the rules of, of the engagement of, of uh, probabilistic type risk assessments would suggest integrating or fusing the various dose response hypotheses probabilistically, uh, of course based on their credibility, to evolve an evidence-based model avoiding the need to choose one over the other. That way, the evidence supporting linear and nonlinear threshold and non-threshold hypotheses is represented in the dose response model based on scientific principles. Included in the fusion process would be such dose response hypotheses, of course, as LNT, threshold models, and hormesis models. Such an approach would seem appropriate, especially given that the Beer report notes that there are still significant uncertainties about the mechanisms that lead to adverse health effects following exposure to ionizing radiation, <clears throat> especially with respect to low levels of radiation. Basing our risk assessments on just one of several hypotheses is not quite in keeping with the spirit of quantifying the risk. So, what other changes might be in order for our risk assessments, and how might they impact the curves I showed you? For example, what new evidence might lead to higher estimates of risk than estimated in the past, and that's represented by these curves? Well, certainly one is non-cancer health impacts, such as radiation-induced chromosomal aberrations that could lead to adverse health effects for some population groups. Neurological damage is another health effect that I am told that has a very different biology than cancer. Another that is frequently mentioned is the psychological consequences of being exposed to low doses of radiation, a factor that could be important in formulating nuclear pl plant evacuation strategies. <clears throat> it has been observed, as a matter of fact, that stress-related phenomena in the aftermath of Fukushima uh, some due to extended evacuation and relocation, may have resulted in a significant number of deaths. The point being that basing too much on a single hypothesis without due consideration to others could lead to making the wrong decisions. What about changes in our state of knowledge that could lead to lower estimates of nuclear facility risk from what we uh, calculated 30 years ago? Probably the biggest impact on reducing our estimates of, nu of nuclear power plant risk has very little to do with the health effects model, and that is what we have learned from the accidents about the releases following a reactor core meltdown. In particular, the evidence from the accidents that have occurred indicates far more confinement capability of the radioactive material during the progression of the accident even in the presence of degraded containments than we took credit for in our earlier risk assessments. Of course, the next accident, accident could be a different story, and we have to account for that in our probabilities. But for the four light water nuclear power plants that have melted their cores, uh, TMI and, uh, and the th three in Japan, there have not been acute radiological consequences, which to the nuclear facility risk professional is a major and positive surprise. To be sure, we have yet to determine what the latent effects might be. So, how would the curves I presented change, and in what direction as a result of the advances that have been made? Well, I don't really know without having do, uh, done the assessment. But my judgment is, had we known then what we know now, the uncertainty spread would be somewhat less than shown in these curves, but I suspect that the central tendency parameters would not change much because of offsetting effects. A final comment I would like to make has to do with what I believe is the value of a probabilistic framework for considering issues where different hypotheses or theories are involved, each having its own uncertainties and supporting evidence. A probabilistic framework can be an effective approach for providing resolution between what we know a lot about what we know a little about and what we don't know, and the various states of knowledge in between. Quantifying the uncertainties probabilistically greatly facilitates the calibration of states of knowledge of fundamental processes, such as the biological effects of low-level radiation. <clears throat> it allows for a systematic process 
to integrate and fuse all the hypotheses considered into a representative model without having to choose one over the other. Let the totality of the evidence determine the dose response model. The beer studies have been enormously beneficial in providing reference material on the state of the relationship <coughs> between material between exposure to ionizing radiation and human health. In my opinion, the information would even be more valuable, much more valuable, had the framework had the Beer Committee adopted a probabilistic framework to process their findings and more quantitatively presented all the supporting evidence that they considered. As a believer in the quantitative approach to risk assessment, let me just add my, <clears throat> end my remarks by observing that the goal of the risk sciences should not be to just bound the results or necessarily to even seek conservative results. We all know that if we keep pushing the conservative button, there comes a point when we are no longer conservative, we are simply wrong. We can do much better than bound our results using the uncertainty sciences. The goal of the risk scientist should be to present the truth about the results, which means quantifying the uncertainties and making transparent the supporting evidence and our confidence in the results we develop. Thank you very much.